Welcome to the Sailing to Success podcast, the show created exclusively for entrepreneurs and small business owners looking for a safe port in the storm of fast-paced business growth. Lindsay Phillips is the founder of Smooth Sailing Online Support, a company dedicated to helping entrepreneurs and small business owners increase customer service, run their business more effectively, and increase their profits. Prepare to be inspired and learn some practical tips and strategies you can use in your business today. And now, welcome your host and captain for this 30-minute excursion, Lindsay Phillips. Hey, everyone. Welcome to the Sailing to Success podcast show. My name is Lindsay Phillips, and I am your host and captain for this 30-minute excursion. And for those of you that um, know me or don't know me, you know that I love to motivate and inspire you entrepreneurs out there, but also really give you practical tips and business-building strategies to grow your business. And today... I'm going to share something that you may not really think about in an entrepreneurial world. Um, you know, we always think business and marketing and sales, but we neglect to really think about our creative side and our innovation. So we're going to be talking about that with um, Tamara Kleinberg. Now, Tamara is the founder of Launch Street. It is the uh, online innovation program and community and creator of the proprietary innovation quotient edge. And we'll go into that a little bit as well. So it's actually the only assessment available to help you discover the unique innovator archetype so you can innovate on demand. And we'll explain what that means, of course. She is a sought after keynote speaker, CrossFit addict, a girl, <laughs> and knee high sock lover. Okay, that one's a little bit weird. <laughs> I'm wearing them right now. Hot a girl. <laughs> Thank you for the visual. <laughs> My pleasure. <laughs> That's the least I can do. <laughs> so thank you so much for, for coming on my show. Oh, I'm excited to be here. I'm ready to dig in. Perfect. So yeah, I was saying, you know, for as an entrepreneur, we just think about sales and, you know, marketing and leads and, you know, all that kind of stuff. And we never think of the creative element. So why is tapping into cre your creative potential important and what does that even mean? Yeah, it's a really important question. And let me just kind of frame it up by saying this. So I, you know, whether you use the word creativity or innovation, okay. what it really means is how do you go to market in a way that is different with your business and in a way that is irresistible to your customers. And most importantly, in my opinion, creates a chasm between you and the competition, right? You want to be in that no competition zone where it's yeah. hard for people to keep up with you. And I think the challenge we have as entrepreneurs, and you said it so well, right? We focus on market marketing, sales, like those very tactical numbers. Things. Yeah, right. The very <laughs> Excel spreadsheets, you know, which I love, right? I oh, measure yeah. everything. Go not a good spreadsheet, girl. Oh my God. Like I'm inundated in spreadsheets, but, but here's the challenge. You can have the most innovative product or service. And let's just assume that we all do. We didn't go to market to be like everybody else. Mm -hmm. We went, you know, we brought this thing, whatever it is to market to serve a need that's not being met. So it's innovative, but then we wrap it up in a package that looks like everybody else. Right. So we build an innovative product, but we don't build an innovative business. Innovation is about thinking differently and acting on those thoughts. It's not just, you know, a painting or taking a long walk while those things certainly spark creative ideas. It's about having that unique selling space in the market. It's your competitive, at the end of the day, innovation is your competitive advantage. And, you know, also as small businesses and also entrepreneurs, we don't have the resources of Fortune 500. Yeah. And, you know, the downside to that, right, is we don't have the resources. The upside to that is we can be nimble and innovative and we can leverage that to our advantage and actually win if we're really focusing on it all the time. So that's a long answer to your question. <laughs> Duh, it wasn't long. That was good. Um, so are you saying then that we, as entrepreneurs, can kind of take more risks in respects to innovation? It, like that's an advantage for, cause, as opposed to, you know, big Fortune 500 companies? Yeah. So if you think about it, so I've done a lot of work with uh, Fortune 500 over the years, Procter yeah. & Gamble, General Mills, Clorox, all of those guys. I helped them bring new ideas to market, new products. Oh, okay. And it was a ton of fun. It's a whole nother conversation about, you know, the frustrations and the fun of working yeah. with large companies. So yes, they have a lot of resources. They get to do a lot of market research. They get to spend time really digging in. They get to create new things, but they're a big ship and they can't move fast. Oh, right, so, right. 
I'm an entrepreneur and I, I'll give you a great example of one. It's so funny. Now, when we look back at businesses, it's very easy to go, oh my God, well, obviously that one. But let's go back to Dollar Shave Club. Um, I interviewed Mike Dubin a, a while back and the founder of Dollar Shave Club. And I was thinking about it, right? They took on a billion dollar set in stone industry, but they did it in a way that was completely different. It was a, was it four or $6,000 video that went viral, right? And they could do it in a weekend. A big company wow. can't do that. But if you think about what they did, the thing, the part that really kind of makes me smile about their story isn't just that they didn't have the money, right? So they had to do it differently and they had to do it in a way that created incredible impact and stood out from everything else. But if you think about it, I mean, the last time you were at the grocery store, were you standing in the razor aisle like, hmm, I'm just not getting a good enough shave. Like my stubbles on my leg are just yeah. 10,000 <laughs> options with I one know. blade, eight blades and a you know, lotion bar, whatever. I definitely need a new, a new razor. If only someone would come out with a new razor. That's not what they did. No. You know, Gillette and those guys were doing that. They did it totally different. They said subscription model, cheap, good enough, and we're going to go to market in a different way. So that's why. That's a, that's a neat story. And I think too, it's almost like when you have to work on a serious budget, you're forced to be more creative. <laughs> yes, you are. I mean, my Excel spreads are not pretty. I've got, <laughs> I've got to be creative about that cash flow. I know. We have to be like online MacGyvers. <laughs> right? Well, you know, if you think about it it, it, it provides us with a really great opportunity to do things differently. There, there's a store, I'm in Denver, and there's a store here. Um, it's a lingerie shop, and they created all this chalk art that oh. led you to the store. And it was just, you couldn't oh, help me. follow the chalk art. Right. So, you know, we talk about marketing and sales and all those things, but we get so myopic about it and just think of the power. If you brought a little bit of innovation to that, instead of doing it the way everybody else is doing it, because the truth is in the marketplace, your customer will reward innovation by opening up their wallets or they will walk away. Those are your options. Yeah, that is true. Now, I mean, I feel that some people are born like mathematical or creative. I mean, so like what if you're not naturally creative? Yeah. Or you feel you're not creative, I guess, too. You know, it's funny. I, so I'm so not mathematical, although my dad has a PhD in statistics. I'm like, what oh happened? God. How did like how did it skip this generation? I know. Right just not fair. But here's the thing about innovation. So I used to think that um, if we all just, you know, I don't know, stepped outside of our comfort zone and dared to be fearless, you know, what would we do if we had no fear? Right. We'd all be innovative. And I also used to think that the innovators were the ones with the blue streak in their hair, the funky like Warby Parker yeah. glasses, right? And they work at cafes. They're so cool. Yeah. I know. Yeah. And They're other people, off. and other people would say that to me all the time. Well, you know, I'm not creative, but Lindsay down the hall is because she's like super cool and just always is breaking the rules. But, you know, in this 20 years of work and research, that blew my assumptions out the window. What I actually discovered is that everybody is innovative. We can all do it. It's actually universal. Oh, okay. But how we innovate is unique to each of us. Right. So, and there's actually nine triggers of innovation, and it's the combination of those top two that create that innovator archetype that you were mentioning in the intro, that your innovation quotient edge. And when we discover that, we discover our natural strengths around innovation. Then we can do more of what's working for us and less of what's not. Because what I often find is that we're actually – sabotaging ourselves we're working against our own natural strengths because that's what right. we're trying to do in work um when we don't need to be we can actually be doing more of what's so i would argue to people out there and i've seen it time and time again everybody's innovative but you, you got to know how you innovate and then you right. have to practice it on a regular basis it's like the body you mentioned me being a crossfit crossfit addict which i totally am but that's a different podcast and you know I have to go to the gym all the time. Like I don't just get to show up once every six months. And the same is true with innovation. I can't set a brainstorm at 3 p.m. with scented markers out of nowhere and expect this magical innovation genie to pop out of the box and work. I've got to practice every day. It's a muscle. Right. Oh, interesting. I would never have thought of it that way. I sort of thought it was like you either have it or you don't. <laughs> yeah, most people do. And it, it's, it's really not the case. And, and the other thing I think with that we have to remember is innovation isn't just creating the next Uber, you know, or the next iPhone. Right. Innovation is about thinking differently about the challenges and the opportunities that you face every day. And that may be a tiny little process improvement or it, be a, it may be a game-changing idea, but all of those are innovative. And in fact, I would argue that some of the businesses that I see be the most 
most successful, focus on those little innovations every day. And it adds up over time versus trying to suddenly be, be disruptive out of nowhere. That's true. And it's funny because like when I think innovation, I don't know why, but I think of like tech, IT yeah. stuff. Silicon Valley. It's so cool. <laughs> I don't know why. It's, yeah. <laughs> you have preconceived like notions in your head and it just, yeah. 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 Well, that's part of the reason why we created the assessment because I wanted to give people that opportunity to be empowered, to know how they innovate so that it's not this thing that somebody else does. And, you know, in reality, we, we can very easily talk ourselves out of it because we've got stuff to do. I mean, my, my to-do list on my little piece of paper is 10 sheets long. I got to get through my to-do list. But if I'm being innovative about it, I'll do it better and I'll actually do it faster and with more impact. Oh, that's an interesting thought, uh, using innovation to be more productive. Yeah, it really does. So I'll give you an example. It's so painful. When we launched the assessment, this was a couple, I think a year and a half ago now, um, I had this to-do list. It was so long. I had programmers needing stuff for me. I had my marketing team needing stuff for me. Like, it was ridiculous. So I don't know why I did this, but I said to myself, okay, no ideas. Like you've got to just hunker down and you got to focus and you got to get this done. So I was so proud of myself. I was getting through my checklist. I was getting it all done. I was like, I am the bomb diggity. This is awesome. And then I went back. So I got everything done. I was so excited. I went back and I realized that I didn't do it well enough. So I had to redo and it cost me money and time, easily $10,000 of stuff that I needed to change because I did it. I checked it off my list, but I didn't do it well enough. And if I'd been innovative from the beginning, and I'll never make this mistake again, I would have done it faster. I also would have done it better. And I think oftentimes in our business world, we do things to get them done, but we don't but they're not good enough. And then we don't get the results we want. If we added that packaging of innovation around it, it would, we would get the results that we were looking for more often than not. That's so true. And it is, yeah. Like, and sacrificing time. I know um, yeah. I get a lot of clients sometimes it's like, let's just get it out. And I'm like, no, <laughs> <That's right. laughs> I'd rather like, you know, really have time to like process it and analyze that it's good enough. And, you know, take that time and make sure it's set up right and, and, you know, think it out. (laughs) Exactly. Oh, I had a friend who just recently, she's a small business owner. She launched a Facebook campaign and it was getting zero results, like not even clicks. It was just painful. And it happened to come up in my feed and it was the worst Facebook ad I'd ever seen. (laughs) And I called her and I said, Hey, listen, I'm sorry, but that was horrible. And she was, I know, but I I was so proud. I got it done. I'm like, I "I know know. what's the point. (laughs) You didn't get it done well. And the minute she looked it up later, kind of looking at it through the outside eye, she's like, yeah, I can't believe I just did that. But that's the, that's the battle we have every day in our heads of, I just got to get this done. But just getting this done leads to indifference in the marketplace because you look and act like everybody else. Exactly. That is so true. Now you mentioned your innovation quotient edge, your assessment. Um, so what is that for exactly? Kind of explain how that works. Yeah. So the innovation quotient edge is an assessment that helps you discover your unique innovator archetype. The reason and I think for us as entrepreneurs and what, what other entrepreneurs out there have told me why it's so powerful for them is it does a couple things. It, first of all, it helps you set up a business and a life that you love. It is very empowering to build a business in a way that works for you and yeah. works for your strengths. And, and we don't always do that. I'll give you some examples in a, in a minute if you want them. And the other thing is um, it helps you become better at the things that you do. So like we were just talking about, you bring that innovation to your work and to your life and the results are 10 times better. The impact is bigger. Yeah. It's all better. And then on top of that, and here's the, I think what has been a little bit of the gold nugget for me in my work once I discovered this, is that when you know your innovator archetype and when you understand how they all work and you know other people's, you can sell better because you can speak oh. to them in a language that actually opens them up to innovative ideas. So especially if you've got an innovative product, like something that's a little bit new, maybe it's a new behavior or a authority out there, or frankly, you're just trying to get buy-in to get that consulting gate closed, you know, that if you can speak their language of innovation, um, it, it's 10 times, you know, your chances of closing the deal are higher. And I'll give you a quick example of this. Mm. I'm an experiential risk taker. Those are my two of the nine triggers that come together. And what that means for me is I leap and then figure it out and I innovate in that leap. I need to be midair. To, and that pressure to innovate. Yeah. And the beauty of that, the, the, 
other risk takers out there, they bring innovation to the table by leaping what other people won't, you know, leave the cliff at all. Yeah. And, the other, and the other one, and this is where people have gotten into trouble trying to sell me, is I'm an experiential. So that means I am hands-on. I have got to get the duct tape out. I cannot, an idea can't live in my head. For me to innovate and think about it and move the needle, I've, I've got to build it in some way, whether that's on a piece of paper or an actual structure. It doesn't matter. I got to build it. So if you come to me as an experiential risk taker and you say, hey, Tamara, uh, I'd like you to buy this you know, online software program. Um, it'll really help your business. In theory, it should do this. I, you have shut me down because I'm all about real world. So if you speak my language and you come to me and you say, hey, Tamara, we've got this thing we want to sell you. Here's what we found out when rubber met the road. Now you've got my attention. Right. So it changes the sales conversation. Everybody has an archetype and you can tell by their language oftentimes what they are. Interesting. And yeah, so you can frame something in a way that's going to excite the other person. Exactly. And especially when it's something that's a little more innovative, you want to get that part of their brain working too. Because, you know, we've all been in that situation. I know I have. It's just horrible, painful. I just, every time it brings back memories, I want to cry out loud. You know, where we've been across the table trying to sell an idea and they just, it's bombing, even though the idea is brilliant. And you know it's brilliant. And you know it could serve their needs. Yeah. And you're bombing because you're not speaking. I wasn't speaking their language. Right. And I would never have thought of an innovation style and, and how they, yeah, like how their brain works, really. Yeah, you know, and it, it's cool. And it, you know, like another one is collaborative. And there are people who are not only magnetic and like to work in teams, but they also pull ideas from disparate places and people and then kind of comes together fully formed versus coming out fully formed. Right. And I can always tell them because they say we a lot, we together, like that's their language. Oh. If I'm on the other side of a person like that, I'm going to mirror that language and I'm going to get them to help me build the idea because they're all about pulling the pieces together. Right, right. As opposed to giving the idea to them fully formed. But for me as a risk taker, I want to see an idea fully formed because yeah. I want to leap with it. Like yeah. I give it to me, I'm going to hug it and squeeze it and leap with it. Yeah, I'm I'm lot like you actually. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll figure it out as I go. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Let's just leap. Well, well, wings. Who needs wings? <laughs> Overrated. Exactly. So, what other kind of innovation styles are there? Yeah, so there's nine of them, but I'll give you just some examples yeah. of recent ones that have come up with people. One of them is tweaker. And uh, this comes up, I say this is one of the more predominant ones. Tweakers are really interesting. They are people who it's not about success and failure. It's never about one full outcome. It is everything is an opportunity to edit, evolve, adjust. And you know them because they're always just, what if I moved it just a little bit this way? What if we adjusted this word a little bit that way? Like they just can't help themselves. Yeah. But the great thing about tweakers, <clears throat> excuse me, is that they will keep going with an idea until they get it right. They won't stop while the rest of us are saying, okay, we're done. It didn't work or it did work. They keep going until they get it. And I think, you know, we all know we've seen it in the marketplace innovation. The best innovation is often just one tweak away. Oh, absolutely. Especially so that's what they do. talking about marketing with Facebook ads and landing pages. And so they're there to me, that person is more patient and that is exactly, that's a great way to say it. And, you know, you want someone who's a tweaker, for example, to your point, especially with the real-time analytics today on your marketing team, mm. because they're going to keep adjusting and tweaking. Like, that's what they think about. How do I make this better? How do I change this? How do I change the outcome that I'm getting? And they're brilliant for innovation that way. So they're one example. Another one is futuristics. Those are the people, you know them. They're always 10 steps ahead of us. I'm like, how did you figure that out? How are you so far ahead of me? I don't understand. Yeah. They're, but they're taking kind of today's data and problems and creating tomorrow's solutions. So their innovation tends to be really long lasting and really um, it, it's easier to implement because they've kind of, they've pushed to that place mm -hmm. before the rest of us. But what's cool about it too, I think is, and what I hear from clients is, if I know how you innovate and you know how I innovate, not only can we both kind of perform at that A level, but the interplay between us becomes even better because now we respect and understand and give each other room to innovate in the right way. All right. That's interesting. So do you work with a lot of teams then versus this assessment being sort of an, on an individual basis? So both. 
I, so our moonshot goal is to unleash 1 million innovators into the world. That's what we are aiming for. And we do it in two ways. Way one is individuals go online and they take the assessment and you get the report within five minutes. You've got all this, how do you perform at your peak? How do you add value? But then also, as we were saying offline about being type A personalities, I am totally type A. It's wrapped up in a control freak right here. Yep, me too. <laughs> it's so bad. Um, so we have a whole access, a password protected area where you can get tools as well because you need to practice as we were talking. Right. About. You got to kind of get used to unleashing that. So, so you can do that as an individuals. And then I also work with a lot of teams. Um, I was just recently working with a small catering company here and it was so wonderful to see the impact it had when everybody on the team is playing at that level, the organization organization rises and okay. you know they're bringing innovative ideas to the table and you know as entrepreneurs as small business owners we can't afford to not have all our people on their a game it agreed and you know in that, yes that's true for big companies i've worked with a lot of them too but even more so I think it absolutely even more so for us. So some of the smaller companies will use the IQE as that way to bring everybody up and make sure they have the right people doing the right things. Yeah, that's an interesting point. And then, because I mean, there's even just personality dynamics in general, right? You don't want to be at cross purposes or some people just want to always be right and have the final say in decisions. I mean, there's so many little nuances, but if everyone was open to understanding how everyone worked, I think, yeah, it would, you'd all achieve so much more faster. Yeah, exactly. I mean, at, at the end of the day, uh, oh, actually, I'll give you one other funny example because this just happened. Inquisitive is one of the triggers and people who are inquisitive uh, recognize that innovation is in the questions, not the answer. So they ask a lot of questions. That's how they pull back the layers of the onion and challenge assumptions. They're really good at that, at that kind of poking the bear, challenging those assumptions. Yeah. But you know them in a meeting because while the rest of us are done, they're still asking questions and you're like, um, okay, Greg, I get it. But once you know that that person does that, you give them room to do it. Yeah. And you know that that's just them innovating. It's not them challenging your authority. Yeah, it's not them true. like poking the bear. That's how they think. Yeah. So, it, you know, you get permission to do that and that's really cool. And, you know, at the end of the day, our competitive advantage is it's our people and it's our ability yeah. to go to market in an innovative way and sustain that innovation that's, that's true. the bottom line for us and you know we like I said we can do things like everybody else but we're not going to get rewarded and we're not going to reach those goals if we do that that's the truth yeah and it's so much like having a team that comes together and works well together it can make it can make or break a business as far as I'm concerned oh yeah without a doubt I mean you can't you know you know this as a business owner you can spend your time managing people which is not fun or you can spend your time managing like a leadership within people mm -hmm. I don't know that was very articulate but I know what you meant kind of off yeah. the cuff but you know what I mean yeah. um, you know it's kind of like you know I've got two boys they're 12 and 8 and uh, they managing the days where they are not getting along and it's all about the personality is super frustrating. And oh, absolutely. It drains you. Oh, it's horrible. The life out of you, man. I oh, I tell you. Know. And some days at work, I feel like that. I'm like, no, what is going on here? But if you can get your team in a really powerful place of being innovative and creating a culture around that and for yourself, um, you know, it, it can be really powerful. And as you know, we were talking about with creating a business for yourself. I have a colleague who's a collaborative, you know, that kind of needs to connect. Mm -hmm. they, they had a business that's online. They do have a business that's online. And they had no connection to their customer and they were just fading away in the dark recesses of their basement. <laughs> and I said, she took the assessment and realized she, one of her things was collaborative. And I said, well, why don't you set up a feedback loop? And office hours online so that you can feed that part of you. Because she was really just not able to come up with any ideas. Yeah. So she switched her business. She didn't change her online model. She's got a product. She needs to be on Amazon. She needs to be online. But she's created an entire part of her business that's all about connecting with people and getting that feedback in that loop. And in every product now comes a little code to kind of give her feedback and get a reward for it. That changed her business because she, every day she was feeding her, her innovative soul in yeah. that way. Yeah. That's an interesting thought. I like that. Yeah, uh, we just we just got to build the business we love. It's life yeah. is too short. And I mean, it's so cliche, but it's too short not to. And we have the opportunity to. We just have to know what, how to do it. That's all. Well, it's funny because um, in, in the fall, like I do a lot of VA work and stuff like that. But it's like 
the admin stuff, I, I don't know, it was sucking the life out of me. And I'm just, it was hard for me to manage and I was just fighting it. And I, I was getting more, you know, people asking me about strategy and content marketing and I, it just brightened me up and I went, uh. bing. And it's like, you know, some things are my strength and I can be creative and it excites me and some things don't. So why am I fighting it? So I just dropped it and I'm like, I'm not doing that anymore. Yeah. You know what? I'm so with you. So last year I went through this. I was probably not supposed to say this out loud, but it's the truth. I went through this whole thing in my business. I went through the four kind of arms, the four revenue streams. One of them was sucking the life out of me and I had to let, and not only was it sucking the life out of me, but it wasn't actually scaling the way everything yeah. else was. And exactly. I think that was kind of a two way issue, right? On one hand, I don't think I had nailed the business model of that part of my business. And on the other hand, I don't think I had the right energy for it. Yeah either and the, and so I had to finally just cut the cord on and get rid of it I know and I bet you felt so much better oh and, my and gosh you can focus the good energy on the good stuff that you love and excel at it yeah no it was a huge game changer for our business that we've had the best start to our year ever yeah and we are mm -hmm. we are 80 percent to our revenues of last year already wow and it was incredible but I think part of that's because I finally just said you know to what you were saying that doesn't not only does it not energize me but it's not working and it's a vicious cycle so why am yeah. I why am I stuck in the mud here I, can, I have legs I can move. I know turns out but sometimes it takes you going through that journey to figure out what that decision was that you had to make Oh, yeah. I mean, if you look at my business, you know, when I open my doors to now, it is a circuitous cluster route of <laughs> what happened. But it got to the right place eventually. Yeah. But I had to go through that journey to get here. You just you, you don't. Somebody was asking me the other day about, well, you know, do you recommend doing a 50 page plan and blah, blah, blah. I thought, well, no, because the minute you hit reality, that plan is going to go up in smoke. So, oh, yeah. Let's like, let's figure out the basics and let's start testing stuff out. But I'm also an experiential, right? I'm just going so to <laughs> I was just gonna say that where it's like, you can map out the beginning, but I guarantee you, as you work through it, your, your thoughts and you're like, well, I don't know yeah. if it's going to work after all. It's like the plan never goes according to plan and that's okay. Yeah, that's exactly right. And, you know, I spend a lot of time and money, you know, doing these vaults and online marketing vaults and video, you know, marketing vaults and entrepreneurs, success stories and all that. And every now and then I pull out a nugget that works. But the truth is what works for them is not going to work in the same way for me. So mm. I, I got to try it out and figure it out. Yeah, that is true. Um, I do want to touch upon quickly uh, before I forget your book. I love the title, Think Sideways. And that's exactly what you're thinking. Thinking differently, um, not going through the same path that everyone else is. Um, tell me a little bit about that book. Yeah, so Think Sideways, I, I consider it more of a playbook. I wanted it to be a, almost a coach's guide versus something that you read once and you go, oh, I really like that. And then it goes on the shelf right. until somebody reminds you that you even owned it to begin with. <laughs> yep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Or if, if you're lucky, you make it past halfway point, right? It's not most books, at least for me. So, so it's a playbook. And each chapter is really an example of a business, an entrepreneur that broke through and thought sideways to get some type of game changing success and the stories are everything from urban wineries to extreme sports to everything in between um, but the going back to being type a the what I'm most proud of in it is at the end of all those stories which are great oh okay I need to think differently about this one is there's a a template for an exercise to get you to think okay. differently in that way. So there's dozens of exercises that are connected to it through another, you know, password portal online. But but I wanted it to be that guide so that if you're you're you know banging your head against the wall and you're going, I need to think about this differently. I'm not sure how. Yeah. Whip it open to any one of the stories in there. Pull something valuable out of it and have a tool to then take that back to your business. That's perfect. Because sometimes it, you have the idea, but it's like, okay, how do I put that into action? Because that that is the tricky part. Well, that, that's the challenge, I think, with a lot of books, and it's, they're not bad, but they focus on the why. And yeah. I mean, I, at the end of the day with innovation, I would say that most of us know why innovation is our competitive advantage and why it's important. So I, right. wanted, to, I wanted to give that the context of it, but I also wanted to give the how so that people could just immediately implement it. Yeah. Absolutely. And I know in the book you talk about um, entrepreneurs breaking the rules. Um, how, how, what do you mean by that and how do you explain it? Like what is, what is breaking the rules? Yeah. Well, so I'll, I'll let you in on a very funny insight about myself to explain where that all comes from. <laughs> um, so I have, I, I'm uh, originally born in Israel. So 
Oh, and I saw so I'm Israeli and American. So I have always believed innately deep in my bones that there are rules out there and that they apply to everybody, but they don't apply to me. And they've never applied to me. And the great thing I've discovered about having that mindset over time is that I have left when other people have taken baby steps because I find a way around things. Right. Because the rules are just there for other people, but I'm not really going to abide by it. So that's the horrible truth about me. The way it you know, applies to business is I, what I found in all of that experience is, is that the rules are oftentimes just other people's way of doing things. And then right. we take them on and assume that they're ours or because they've been done that way in the past, that's the way it has to be done. Right. And when you're willing to challenge those rules and assumptions, you can create that meaningful, unique selling space, that, you know, powerful business idea in a much smarter, more, more meaningful way to your marketplace, whoever that is, um, because you're breaking the rules that are there that really just, I mean, yeah, do they apply? Yeah, sometimes like I'm going to stay on my side of the road, those lines, those rules matter. But how you go to market, how you deliver your business, how you build your business, how you decide to sell, how you decide, you know, which marketing channels to use. Those aren't rules. Those are just right. other people's way of doing things. That's true. And I think it's funny within the entrepreneurial world, like, you know, you think of the greats, like, you know, oh, what is Joe Polish doing? What is Frank yeah. doing? What is Anthony Robbins doing? And if they're doing it, well, that has to be the golden way that everyone has to do it. Cause that's the only path to success. Right. Um, which is, you know, you can take little pieces that you think are smart, but yeah, I don't necessarily think it's the be all and end all. No, I mean, you know, the, a great example of it is um, Tough Mudder and Spartan, all these well, now Ooh. extreme sports. But when Tough Mudder started, the interesting thing, this is actually in the book, Think Sideways. When they started, they were, so the Will Dean, the founder, he actually presented his idea. He was at Harvard Business School to the professors as a business competition. And he did, not only did he not win, but the professors told him it'll never work. There's not enough customers. This is not how it's done. Because yeah. at that time, it was all endurance, endurance, running, marathon, triathlon, which believe me are hard I'm not knocking those but he went and he said no no I want to do a completely different model in a completely different way so the rule I mean the rules are there to be broken you just got to figure out what you really want to accomplish out of it yeah and not to break the rules for the sake of breaking the rules no that's not I mean that doesn't do anything no you know the, the question is what what is it I'm really trying to get at here what am I trying to get after and what rules are in my way that are going to prevent that because yeah. those are the ones I'm going to break that's so true. So you're a rule breaker? Yeah. <laughs> I, they don't apply to me. I don't even break them because they don't apply to me. So how can I break something that doesn't even, you know, oh, not you even go. in my world? Yeah, it's, my husband laughs at me all the time for it. He finds it the funniest thing because if there's a rule, I'm like, no, I'm going around that. That's no, not, I'm going to do something. I'm going to figure it out on my own. <laughs> yeah, but you know, nine times, so sometimes I get in trouble. Yeah. But, but nine times out of 10, it works to my advantage or the advantage of my business to go around the rules. I'll give you a very small kind of, but meaningful to me example is I was, I do a lot of keynoting and I was stuck at the very last slot of a two day conference. And that's, if you do any keynoting, you know that, you know, half the people are gone at that point. Yeah. And, and there were two others. They were doing all these concurrent things. It wasn't your traditional, like, big main stage keynote. It was all these different concurrent lightning rounds. But I knew I was at the end. And this was a market of people who didn't know me. And so... <laughs> I broke the rules. So I thought, well, what am I going to do? I got to get people to stay. I got to, this is, you know, what am I going to do? And I was talking to the other speaker and he said, well, I'm just going to make the most of who comes in the room because that's what you're supposed to do. It's exactly hmm. what he said to me. And I thought, no. Yeah. So I created these little cards that said, are you a quitter? I didn't think so. See you at 3 p.m., blah, blah, blah. You nice. know. And then I put them in all the women's bathrooms because it was mostly women attendees at the conference. That's hilarious. <laughs> so I just shared that example to say that, you know, they just don't apply most of the time. And I got into a little bit of trouble for doing that. But you know, <laughs> my, my thought was, well, but don't you want people to stay and engage in the conference and get good content? Yes. Yeah, so I'm going to make that possible by breaking a couple of rules. And, and it wasn't a rule in the contract. So that's right. It, it's not right. that. I did not see that in my 12 page contract. I'm pretty sure it wasn't there. <laughs> that's awesome. I love it. That. That's, uh, that's hilarious. I mean, you must do it all the time too. Yeah. I'm just, I, I sort of feel like I phrase it as a, I'm just stubborn where it's like, I don't take no for an answer that something can't be done. I'll figure it out come hell or high water. Yeah. I love the stubborn, I'll figure it out. And 
you know, no, no is funny. No is like rules. Once you hear it, you go, oh, that's the way it is. But no to me is just a, it's, it's a stop on the train. Like, okay, that didn't work. So how about this path over here? I know. And it's funny, I'll get a staff member of mine and I'll be like, oh, can you research or figure this out, whatever. And they're like, oh, I just found this. I'm like, no, no, I know no. there's another way. I know they're like, no, you got to figure this out. Yeah. <laughs> but their brain just doesn't clearly work like mine. <laughs> well, that's, that's why you're the owner though, right? I mean, yeah. you know, some of us have to be the ones that, and maybe you're a risk taker when you take the profile, it'll be interesting to see, you know, okay. some of us have to leap. And the beauty of that is we take the other people along with us. Yeah. We just have to be mindful of not everybody's going to leap the way yeah. we do. That's and we got to And we got to leverage them for their strengths and know that we're going to have to pull them along a little. Yes, exactly. <laughs> now, I know you had an awesome um, offer or giveaway uh, for the audience, so I'd love for you to share that. Yeah, so if you go, let me say the site first, and I'll talk about what it is. If you go to go to launchstreet.com, so G-O-T-O launchstreet.com slash sailing, we have something that we call the language of innovation method, and it's a package that we've delivered. And the reason I put this together is because, you know, we've been talking a lot about how do you be innovative? How do you bring that to your business and your world? Half the battle is getting the ideas, but the other half of the battle is getting buy-in and traction on those ideas. Totally. Whoever those key stakeholders are, that could be your team, it could be you know your customer, it could be your boss, like whoever that person is. And what I've discovered, and um, through some painful experiences and slaps across the face, <laughs> is that you know innovation has its own language, its own rhythm, and if we can get into the into that right language, we can get more buy-in for I, for our ideas. So you know a small example is if. If I say to you, hey, um, see, I've got a water bottle on my desk. So, hey, I've got this water bottle and it um, self heats or self cools and it knows what vitamins I need and it fills them in naturally and the top is magnetic so you never lose it and it automatically calls my name if I'm 10 feet away. What do you think? That's how we tend to present our ideas. Totally. And when we do that, we force people to an up or down vote. They either love it or hate it. Most of them are going to hate it because we're humans and we're skeptical and that's what you do. And then we're stuck on the other side of that desk going, I don't understand why you don't get this idea. It's brilliant. Duh. <laughs> and they're not getting it. But the idea is not enough. So what I've learned to do is things like open questions. And instead of saying, what do you think? Or here's the idea. Now what? Or how do we implement this? I'll come to you with my crazy water bottle with magnetic top that yells my name. I'll say, hey, what would you do to strengthen this idea? Hmm. It's a tiny little shift in language. But what I've discovered that when I do that, I get people on board for the journey. Now, that's not to say my idea is going to end up where I started or it's going to happen. Yeah. But at least I get people on for the journey. And one of my favorites, a woman yelled this out at a keynote um, I was doing uh, in Minneapolis a couple months ago. While I was talking about this language of innovation, some of the other ways you can do and how you get them to see, the, feel the pain to get to the possibilities. And she said, well, what do I do about this? My boss says, well, what's that going to cost me? That's his way of shutting her down. And we all have those people in our lives. Yes. You know, we own our own business or someone else's. What is it going to cost me? So what I told her to do was the next time you have that idea, you share the idea and then you say, what do I need to do to make this idea cost worthy? before they can even say anything. And she tried it and she emailed me and said, oh my God, Tamara, it was so amazing. Before my boss said it, I said, you know, the cost worthy question and I got the budget that I needed because he helped me figure out what I was missing. No. Nice. So that's the offer. So if you go to go to launchroot.com slash sailing, we have a whole video and package. There's three different um, elements to the method that, you know, we don't have time to go into, but it's all about getting that traction because, you know, idea is only as good as the execution. And I want people to have execution too. Awesome. Love that. And I love your, how you share tons of examples because it really helps kind of paint that picture and understand it a little bit better. That's super helpful. Well, I haven't been knocked down all these times to not share it. I mean, I can't keep it to myself. <laughs> I mean, I have been on the floor a lot in my business. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for your information and your, your insight. It's been really helpful. Um, it's even helped me as an entrepreneur kind of think about things a little bit differently in my team. Uh, so I thank you for that. Oh, thank you. And you know, when you're the owner too, going to them and say, you know, what holes do you see and how would you fill it for ideas helps them get on board with the ideas that as the owner, you sometimes know you want to pursue, but you got to get buy-in. 
Absolutely. That's so true. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, so that is it for this special episode okay. of the Sailing to Success podcast show, folks. Um, of course, check out this episode and um, other episodes, my blogs and videos at lindsayphillips.com. And of course, we'll have all of those links that Tamara uh, shared and mine at the bottom of the show notes as well. So until next time, folks, I wish you all a productive and profitable week and may the wins always be at your back. You've been listening to the Sailing to Success podcast, the show created exclusively for entrepreneurs and small business owners looking for a safe port in the storm of fast-paced business growth. To make sure you don't miss a single profit-boosting show, subscribe to this podcast at iTunes and www.sailingtosuccesspodcast.com. To learn more about how Lindsay and her team can help you increase customer service, run your business more effectively, and increase your profits, go to www.ssonlinesupport.com. That's www.ssonlinesupport.com. Now go and implement what you've learned and come back next week for more Sailing to Success podcasts.